Hi, everybody. My name is Eva Lanzocht. I'm a professor at Universidad San Francisco de Quito. And today I'm going to um, explain a little bit about load testing of structures and in particular bridges. So I'm going to switch off my video for now um, and we will watch the slide and at the end I will say goodbye with my video back on. So here's an overview of what I will cover in this presentation today. I will give an overview of current activities related to load testing um, in, from the international perspective. Then I will give you um, an insight in some of the research that we've been doing at Delft University of Technology. Um, so I, I, I have to add that I introduced myself as a professor at Universidad San Francisco de Quito. I also have a part-time appointment at uh, TU Delft. I will give you some current recommendations with regard to preparation and execution of load tests and in particular proof load tests and I'll round off with a summary and conclusions. So this topic has gained some um, uh, attention over the past years internationally. There's some new load testing standards that either have been developed very recently or that are under development in Germany, in the United States, the e-circular on load testing of bridges about which I will talk a little bit further since it has been recently published. There is a work that's been done by ACI Committee 437, uh, which is strength evaluation, and that really focuses on buildings. Um, and then there is the ACI Committee 342 that is working on a, um, on a condition assessment guideline um, where there will also be some information on low testing. Uh, and there may be um, more information on load testing in the uh, new FIB model code, which will focus more on how to deal with existing structures. And in the Netherlands, we've done some work on load testing for the past few years, um, but we've also identified topics for further research, which uh, either started about a year ago or is about to start. There's two projects in there. The International attention to this topic has, is also reflected by the number of mini symposia and special sessions that have been organized over these past years um, at the ACI convention in the fall of 2017, at the YAPMAS 2018, at EALSA 2016 and 2018, at um, BEI 2019, etc., and the FIP 2017 and other instances. So as you can see here on this photograph, there's a, a, a number of people that um, form this community of, of uh, researchers and practicing engineers that are interested in low testing. And this was a photograph that we took after, which was really the first um, mini symposium of the ones that have been organized since then. Uh, and that was at IALSA in 2016. At IALSA 2018, uh, one of the nice things that I wanted to mention is that three of my students from OSFQ, uh, from Quito, also um, participated with uh, their undergraduate research theses that they did. Um, also looking at stop criteria, um, as well as a combination with nonlinear finite element analysis. And there's also been a bit more of interest in low testing, but then low testing prior to opening new structures in Ecuador. One last thing that I wanted to mention with regard to low testing in conferences is that um, there will be a special session at EAPS 2021 in Ghent um, at the uh, at the EAPS Congress and the deadline for abstracts is September 15th, 2020. 
And the title of the uh, special session will be Towards Extending the Service Life of Existing Concrete Infrastructure Through Advanced Assessment Methods. So those advanced methods could be um, either field testing, of which load testing is one option, or advanced uh, analysis methods. So really load testing, as, as we are seeing it, is an, um, an advanced method to evaluate existing structures. In terms of um, publications or volumes that really focus on on low testing, there is the ACI special publication 323 titled Evaluation of Concrete Bridge Behavior Through Load Testing, International Perspectives. There is a article collection in the journal Frontiers in Build Environment Bridge Engineering. Um, I've also had the chance to work as the editor on two books on load testing of bridges. Um, essentially two volumes of, on the topic, um, within the Structures and Infrastructure series of Taylor and Francis. And the most recent um, publication, so to say, or um, compilation of information is the Transportation Research eCircular, number 257, of which you can find the download link right here. It is free for download, so if you're interested um, in this topic, um, you're certainly welcome to, to download the, the e-circular, which is titled Prim Around Bridge Load Testing, and also give your, or, or your thoughts and opinions on this. Uh, you can see here the list of people that uh, contributed to the e-circular and also the people that then reviewed um, prior to publication. So let's now look at the history of load testing. Originally, a load test was done prior to opening of a new bridge. And it was really to show the traveling public that the bridge is safe. And really traditionally, the engineer who designed the bridge had to stand under the bridge. So if the bridge would collapse during the test, the engineer for sure would die with his mistake. And that really is proof load testing. Um, I will talk further about the different types of load tests, both diagnostic and proof load testing. And as we say, putting a lot of load on a bridge to show that it can withstand that load is called proof load testing. So we've had less proof load tests prior to opening new bridges um, in the past years. So why is that? Well, first of all, we have better design methods and uh, better computational tools that have been developed since the 1950s. Uh, when it comes to identifying really the bridge behavior and sometimes uh, the way load is shared amongst members, we can have then information from a diagnostic load test, which is essentially with a lower load level and, and, and sufficient measurements. And nowadays, prove load testing and load testing is more geared towards existing structures. In some cases, we still use a load test, either a proof load or diagnostic load test prior to the opening of a structure. Uh, the case that I mentioned earlier of Ecuador, that is when we have a, um, a, a new type of bridge or a bridge that's constructed with a, a method that had not been used previously in the country, then the client wants to have a confirmation that the bridge is behaving the way it was designed, which you can do uh, with a diagnostic load test. Um, and sometimes when you have, as I said, when you have special types of structures, new materials that are used, you may also want to do a typically diagnostic load test to prove that the bridge is indeed behaving the way it was designed. The work that we've done over the past decade at TU Delft has focused on proof load testing of existing bridges. This is mostly applied to reinforced concrete slab bridges. Often these structures are, at least upon assessment, found to be shear critical. The safety philosophy that we follow is, is largely based on what the German guidelines prescribe. 
And since proof load testing involves large loads, it's important that we have a safe execution of uh, the proof load test. We've also done, we've done combination of theoretical work, uh, some pilot proof load tests, we've had a chance to do two collapse tests, and uh, we've also uh, done some additional laboratory testing. And as I mentioned earlier, we've we are now um, starting two new research projects to look more into details on some open research questions related to proof load testing. So why is load testing important or what can it be used for? In the Netherlands, just as in many other countries in, in Europe, the majority of the existing bridges date back to the 1960s and 70s. Now, the loads that they were originally designed for are um, are not the same as the loads that these bridges are now facing. Nowadays, they are facing higher loads. So it's a combination of end of service life and sometimes material degradation and deterioration with larger loads. And then the question is, is, is a certain bridge still safe? And the traditional way of approaching this is, of course, doing a regular assessment um, that can be either based on a, a quick simplified calculation with some conservative assumptions, or it can be based um, using a linear finite element model. Um, but if those methods show that the loads, load effects, are larger than the expect than the assumed capacity, then there may be that we have an idea that there are some additional load carrying paths that act in the structure that make that this bridge still fulfills the code requirements. And in that case, we can either go towards a nonlinear finite element analysis, but then we need all the right information and have a good idea of the effects of material degradation and deterioration. Or if we have a lot of uncertainties, we can use a load test. So here you see an overview of the bridge stock in the Netherlands, and you really see the, the boom in construction in, in the late 1960s. So as I mentioned before, there's two types of load testing that one can use. Diagnostic load testing and proof load testing. And I've already hinted a little bit at which one does what, but let's really look into detail and this. Diagnostic load testing is always used together with an analytical model many cases that will be a finite element model. And in this case, what you look at is the difference between the original analytical model and the structural response measured during the test. And then you go change some properties in the model in such a way that your measured responses approach as good as possible the predicted responses of the analytical model. And then based on that analytical model, you can use, you, you can turn that into a model suitable for rating of the bridge. So going, for example, from measured um, average values of material properties to design values. That of course requires a fair amount of instrumentation during the test. And um, you, for example, if you want to have information on composite action, you may want to apply strain gauges over the height of a girder and see um, where the neutral axis is and, and, and compare that to analytical models of with and without composite action. And since these are things that for which you don't need very high loads, you can um, carry out such a test with relatively low load levels, so serviceability limit state. The second type of load testing is proof load testing, as was also used in the uh, past for showing to the traveling public that a bridge is safe. The idea is still the same. You apply the factored live load, so the load required by the code, and you show that the bridge can carry that load. So you show that the bridge fulfills the uh, code requirements. 
Now that of course involves higher load levels and higher risks. Um, and in this case, your instrumentation becomes important because you need to, um, you will need to apply that high load in several load steps and load and unload to really see if the uh, structural behavior is not influenced by the load. If you would start to see nonlinear behavior, well, that's an indication that something is going wrong. And that's what we find in the safety philosophy. This is um, um, the safety philosophy that is given in the German guideline for low testing. And I, I should say that the German guideline is for proof low testing of plain and reinforced concrete buildings. So it's, um, we are extending it here to bridges, but the overall ID um, is applicable to, to many different applications. Um, so what you see here is a general graph of the relation between action and effect. So that could be, for example, load displacement. And as I said before, if you start to see nonlinear behavior, well, that's a sign of something is going to happen to the structure if you continue loading. So that sign, that threshold limit that you observe in the measurements is what we call a stop criterion. Um, if you reach a stop criterion, then you cannot continue loading. Um, it can either mean that failure is near or that irreversible damage is near. Now, based on this idea of stop criteria, we can have two cases during a load test. We can have that the um, our target proof loads, the load that we need to show that the bridge fulfills the code requirements, is less than the load at which we reach the threshold. Well, in that case, we have a successful test and, and we can say, yes, the bridge indeed fulfills the code requirements. We've shown it now with our experiment on the bridge. But in the other case where our target load is larger than the load at which we reach a stop criterion, then unfortunately we have to stop the test at the point where we reach the load that corresponds to exceeding of a stop criterion. And in that case, we have to further analyze the results. It may be that the bridge or the building still fulfills the code requirements at a lower, um, at the lower load level. So we may, for example, for a bridge, we may need to post a bridge. For a building, we may need to, to put restrictions to usage or uh, occupancy to the building. If we link this to, to, if we link proof load testing to concepts of structural reliability, essentially what we have before the test is we have this distribution function, uh, probability density function of the resistance, which, uh, regardless of the shape that you want to use, whether you want to use a normal distribution or log normal, looks something like what we see here in the dashed line. Now, if we prove load to a certain load level, then we already know that the capacity, the resistance, is equal to R larger than the value to which we tested. So we can update that, um, that distribution function that, sorry, that density function, and based on that, recalculate the reliability index of the bridge. Now, as I said before, we typically use load testing for bridges on which we have large uncertainties. That can be if information is lacking, or for cases where we have damage, for example, caused by alkali silica reaction, and we don't really know what the effect on the capacity is. The existing information that we have uh, in different codes and guidelines is as follows, as I've already mentioned a number of times, the German guideline, which contains stop criteria related to the strain in the concrete, the strain in the steel, uh, crack width and residual crack width for both new and existing cracks and residual deflection. It's applied or it's applicable only for the failure mode of flexure and um, one of the issues there is since it is, has quite uh, strict requirements to maximum crack width, 
um, what should we do for structures that already have large existing cracks? We can have a bridge that, that has a large crack already. Well then, and it could be a good candidate for low testing because we don't really know that much about it. But if we really take that, the German guideline to the letter of the code, it says, well, you have this maximum crack width. And if that crack width is already reached or exceeded at the beginning of the test, essentially you're not allowed to test it. Um, so for those cases, it, it may be sufficient then um, that afterwards you do a repair of those cracks if there is no real structural issue with the bridge. Um, but that is something that a low test could in give information about. In North America, there's also the, uh, as I mentioned before, there's the uh, code of ACI 437, which is a 437.2 uh, from 2013 which you can see screenshot here and that uses uh, acceptance criteria it doesn't use stop criteria but acceptance criteria so the the idea of stop criteria is that they really function as, as thresholds whereas acceptance criteria are typically checked after the low test to see if the behavior has been acceptable so there's a difference in in um in concept there now the acceptance criteria from ACI 437 are related to residual deflection, permanency ratio and deviation from linearity. Besides buildings, there's also for bridges the manual of uh, bridge rating through load testing, um, which, uh, of which the IDs have been incorporated in the AASHTO manual for bridge evaluation. So the AASHTO manual for bridge evaluation is, uh, governs as a code. In terms of research that we need um, for the Netherlands, there was a need for combining the practical recommendations. Um, we wanted to look at both um, filler modes of flexure and shear, and of course the associated stop criteria. And another topic that really requires further research that I'm not going to address in detail in this presentation because we are just getting started with that research is what is really the target proof load that we need to apply to uh, to demonstrate with the test that the bridge fulfills the code um, requirements. I'm going to show you what we're doing at, at the moment but we need further uh, reliability based research to actually uh, quantify safety in this case. Over the past decade, as I mentioned, we've done a number of Privolo tests in the Netherlands. The first two tests, Headache and Maidenblick, um, were carried out with very limited involvement of the university. Um, we've been involved mostly since 2013 with the tests on Vlaime Oost, then the Halve Mans Bridge, Selweg in 2015, the Beek. And um, there's two bridges that we've been able to test to collapse on purpose. Um, those were the Rettis Hill Bridge in 2014, of which you can see here um, the photograph, and the Vecht Bridge in 2016. Rettis Hill Bridge was, as you can see here, a, a typical reinforced concrete slab bridge. The Vecht Bridge is actually the only pre-stressed bridge that we tested in this uh, list of cases here. Based on those pilot proof load tests that we did, we have been able to identify some practical recommendations. Now, the first one is related to the preparation steps. How do I prepare a low test? The first thing that you need to define is why am I going to test this bridge? So what are my objectives? Based on your objectives, you need to see, can I, um, address this with a low load level and a diagnostic load test and, and the correct measurements of the structural response or do I need a proof load test? Once you've sorted that out, um, which is actually when you're still evaluating whether to test or not, then when you actually go to prepare the actual test, the first thing that you should do is go see the bridge, do a field inspection. Um, do you have the plans of the bridge and 
um, are those plans still up to date? You can, you may have the plans that were the as built plans and you go to the bridge and see, ah, there's been a widening here or hmm, the layout of the lanes is different or they, they made the height of the, um, of the sidewalk higher so I can't uh, put my load right there. Um, so those are things that you need to know before you start to think even about where to apply the load and where to apply your sensors. You also need to check the bridge to see in which state it is. If there's a lot of cracking, well, you need to register that before the test. You need to make the crack map. If there is signs of deterioration, you need to uh, identify that before the test so that you know the state of the bridge before the test and, and can show that it's not your test that caused all that cracking. And you need to see the site, right? How can you access the bridge itself? How can you access if at all the bottom face of the bridge? Can you apply sensors easily or will you need um, to put a pontoon so you can work on the water or will you need to uh, to build scaffolding or arrange to have scaffolding built for you. Those are all practical considerations that you need to know before you can even start thinking on how to test the bridge. It's also important to do your first assessment of the bridge to, to have an idea of what would be the, um, the rating that comes out before doing the low test as well as I recommend to make calculations based on, in addition to the assessment calculations, to do calculations based on the average material properties so that you can really have an idea of which failure mode would be governing if you see this as a test, which loads can we expect cracking, uh, what do I expect for my load displacement diagram, my moment curvature diagram, etc. So really prepare it as if you would prepare a test in the lab. In terms of identifying the critical position um, for a proof load test, we want to have the position that results in the largest sectional moment or shear. Now, when, when it comes to largest sectional moment, what we do for preparation is we take the uh, Eurocode live load combination and, and look for the position that results so basically doing the influence line, look for the position that results in the largest sectional moment. For shear, applied to slab bridges, what we use is a position at two and a half D from the support, since we know from testing slabs in the lab that within two and a half D we have direct load transfer, so that is never a governing position. Now, we currently define our target proof load based on saying we need the load that creates the same sectional shear or same sectional moment as with your code live load combination and its factors. Um, now the value for the fa those factors depend in the Netherlands on the uh, safety level. So if I go back one slide, you see that we have different safety levels in the Netherlands that have different load factors associated to it. Um, and they're based then on a different reliability index. So say that we want to look at the usage safety level. In that case, we apply on the live load combination, the live load factors of the usage um, load combination. And based on that, or based on the similarity in sectional shear, sectional moment, we find our target proof load. When it comes to doing the actual tests in the field, um, our recommendation is to use a cyclic loading scheme. So load and unload in different load levels. We've been using acoustic emission measurements and there it's the, we found that um, we can have and compare the outcome um, of loading and unloading branches at different levels. The reason to have different uh, cycles to the same load level is as well that we want to check the linearity and the reproducibility of the measurements. And after each level, or I should say after each cycle, we also want to check if there's no large residual deformations. 
As for the stop criteria, these need to be checked after every load cycle to see if we can continue testing. And that's still a topic that is in progress. We are currently working on the development of robust and safe stop criteria for shear. But we will be testing slabs in the laboratory to study further crack opening and strain development um, in slabs under cycles of loads. Now to, to give you an idea of how all this works in practice, I'm going to show you a video now. And since it's a little bit small on my screen, I'm going to change to sharing the, um, the video directly in the video software. So in this video, what you see is a time lapse of um, a proof load test that we did. And at this step, we are placing the, the load plates. So these are the, uh, the four wheel prints as we have it in the Eurocode with the load cells to measure. And the system that we use to apply the load in a controlled way is based on uh, hydraulic jacks. So these red boxes here are the hydraulic jacks um, so that we can apply in a controlled manner our different load cycles. And here you can see the instrumentation that we have on the bottom. And we follow the measurements in real time during the test. And at this point, we were discussing some of the stop criteria as well.
And here you can see speed up the load cycles and how you can really see with our bare eye the structural response. So let's return to the PowerPoint presentation again. Besides the pilot tests, we've also done some testing in the laboratory to check the stop criteria. Uh, we've had the chance to test some slab strips that were taken from the Rijtesgeld bridge, which was the bridge that we tested until failure in 2014. We tested those beams under a cyclic loading protocol and found some shear and flexural failures. And we also analyzed um, a, a few beams that were uh, tested within a larger research program of my colleague about the shear capacity of, um, of, of beams. With, and, and in this case, these beams had plane reinforcement. We tested them with cyclic loading and we looked at shear and flexural failures. But of course, all of these were beams and we are interested in the behavior of slabs. So that is why um, shortly we will, uh, we plan to start testing slabs uh, in the laboratory to improve the stop criteria for shear. So to summarize, I've shown that load testing is a topic that is currently internationally of interest. Historically, we use load testing prior to opening to show the traveling public that a bridge is safe, whereas nowadays it is used for existing bridges as a tool for assessment. And our best practices as of now are to first identify your goals. What do you want to get out of the test? and how should you do it? Based on that, how should you do it? We identify whether we need a diagnostic or proof load test. Um, it's important to prepare well for the test so that you can, uh, um, for example, uh, instrument the correct positions. It's important to go see the bridge before testing. It's important to, as I said, monitor the structural behavior during the test. And especially for proof load testing, we recommend cycles of loading. Of course, I have to say, you've already seen in the video that there's many, many people involved with, um, with doing a test and, and with this work. So I would like to acknowledge the contributions of everybody who's been involved with this. All my colleagues, uh, current and former colleagues at TU Delft, uh, Albert Bosman, Sebastian Enzing, Dick Hordek, Rutger Kukuk, Marco Rose, Cor van der Veen, Patrick van Hemert, Yuguang Yang. And uh, nowadays we also have Gabriela Serrat in Feng Xiaozang um, working on related topics. Former students at TU Delft, Arthur, Thomas, Rick and Werner, from Rex Waterstaat, the many people that have been involved with this, the contractors that have been involved in the field, the people of Mammut involved with the load execution. And of course, we couldn't have done this work without the funding from the provinces, um, as well as Rex Waterstaat and some smaller funding um, for desk research from Oseveku. So with this photograph I, from the Rijtesgeel Bridge and uh, some of us here uh, helping the bridge, I would like to say goodbye to you. Um, as I said, I was going to say goodbye with my video. So that's what I'm doing here. I wanted to say goodbye to you. Hope everybody stays safe and healthy. Um, during these difficult times, if you have any comments on this presentation, feel free to reach out to me. You can see my email address here on the bottom. And with that, I will wrap up for today. And, and thank you again for listening to this presentation. <laughs>